There comes a time in everyone's life where they decide to watch all 24 Pokemon movies over the course of a couple of weeks in order to rank them. That might not be true, actually. I can say that I've reached that point, though. I'm writing this prior to beginning the marathon, so I'm not exactly sure what conclusions I'll draw, but I'm excited to watch through these movies. Of the 24 films released right now, there are about 10 or so that I either haven't watched or have no memory of watching, so lots of these are new to me. I'll be ranking these starting with those that I consider worse so that we can have a bit more optimism with each passing minute. Hopefully that's how this works out. A quick introduction for those completely unfamiliar with how these films work. The Pokemon movies almost exclusively center around Ash Ketchum and his various companions with a legendary, mythical, or otherwise iconic Pokemon heavily involved. They always try to teach a valuable lesson that usually Ash and the viewer can both learn. It should probably go without saying, but there's going to be quite a lot of spoilers for the various Pokemon movies in this video, so here's your warning. Anyway, this is probably going to be an excruciatingly long video, so let's get started with whichever film I've decided is worst. Number 24, Pokemon Mewtwo Strikes Back Evolution. This is a CGI remake of Pokemon the first movie, and I'm actually going to immediately contradict myself and say that this isn't the worst Pokemon movie. It just offers virtually nothing in the way of originality. Evolution tells the familiar story of Mewtwo's laboratory creation, subsequent escape, and attempted vengeance on the human race who've wronged him. That's fair. Ash, Misty, and Brock experience the legendary Pokémon's wrath firsthand as they're all invited to a mysterious party on New Island, the site of the destroyed laboratory where Mewtwo was created. The climactic battle sees Mew taking on Mewtwo as the titular character's clone army face off against their original counterparts. In the end, Ash can't take the fighting anymore and runs between Mew and Mewtwo in an attempt to stop them. Always had more heart than brain, that one. Their attacks both hit him, turning him to... Obsidian? Whatever it is, it breaks the heart of Pikachu, which in turn deeply pains all the onlooking Pokémon, clone or not. As they all weep for what they're seeing, their tears are absorbed by Obsidian Ash, and when Pikachu joins them, Ash is revived. Mewtwo sees the error of its ways, dropping an iconic quote before wiping everyone's memories and leaving New Island with the clones. I see now that the circumstances of one's birth are irrelevant. It is what you do with the gift of life that determines who you are. So you may recognize the voice there, that of Dan Green, aka Yugi, who will be popping up a few times here. That performance is one of the definite highlights in Mewtwo Strikes Back Evolution. As a remake, I feel like it needs to do more than it did though. The major change from the original is obviously the look of the film. At times I found myself really enjoying the new style, but I thought the design of the human characters was sort of off-putting. I think the biggest issue for me was the eyes, because Brock actually looks fine most of the time. Aside from the animation change, several battle sequences were extended and some weird errors from the original were fixed. Nothing too significant. Brock does get an original line in Evolution though, which I actually loved. Let's gaze upon sun-drenched seas and eat my famous jelly donuts made with love! I'm a simple man. If you reference Brock's jelly-filled donuts, I'm gonna enjoy it. Overall, I did have a fun time watching this movie. It's filled with great Ash and Pikachu moments which are essentially the backbone of almost every Pokemon movie, but they just don't have anything new to do here. That's my only issue. It feels completely unnecessary and that's why I've put it in last place. It's also a good sign because I really struggled to find any Pokemon movie that I didn't at least enjoy a little bit. Okay, number 23? Pokemon 3, The Movie, Spell of the Unknown, Entei. Wow, that is not a catchy name. I feel like this might be an unpopular choice. Given my channel name, I sort of wish the movie about Unknown performed better here, but this was the original movie I enjoyed the least. Here we have the story of Professor Spencer Hale and his daughter Molly. While researching the quote-unquote legendary Pokemon Unknown, Professor Hale is sucked into the Unknown Dimension. After his mysterious disappearance, Molly is now parentless, her mother also having disappeared years ago. While playing with the unknown letters to further drive home that point, Molly summons a... what do we think the collective noun for unknown would be? A swarm of unknown? A herd? I'm gonna go for a scrabble. So yeah, Molly unintentionally summons a scrabble of unknown. They're able to create illusions and at her request, conjure up an Entei who sounds just like her father. Probably because they're both voiced by Dan Green. I'm like Entei, am I? <laughs> Imagine that. I am Entei. Anyway, back in Pallet Town, Professor Oak speaks about research that Professor Hale had recently sent him on the unknown. I guess I can't be mad that nobody spells my channel name right anymore. This research is incredibly insightful, telling us stuff like, unknown speaks each other over the electric wave. Fascinating. 
Okay, I'm only 15 minutes into this movie, let's speed this up. The illusion grows larger and larger until it's covering the entire town surrounding the Hale Mansion and eventually Entei kidnaps Delia Ketchum because Molly wants a mom. This is a very confusing family dynamic. Eventually Ash makes it inside the house along with Misty and Brock. When Ash reaches Molly and explains to her what's happening, she loses it a little bit and a massive battle with Entei ensues. At the last second, with Entei readying to deal the killer blow, Molly calls for everything to stop and agrees to leave the illusion. The unknown aren't too happy about that, but Entei stops them, which feels confusing as it was an illusion that they created, but at this point I'm happy to go along with it. Everyone's free, and seeing as they apparently forgot, it's during the end credits that Professor Hale returns to the real world. Then, out of nowhere, Molly's mom comes back too. I honestly don't know why, it was sort of implied that she was dead. Where has she been this whole time? That was such an unnecessary detail to add. So what makes this the worst original Pokemon movie? I don't want to say it was all about Mrs. Hale returning at the end, although that did really confuse me. The whole thing is just kind of boring. My love for the franchise means I still had some fun with it, but it was definitely the least enjoyable watch of the marathon. Number 22, Pokemon Jirachi Wishmaker. I think this might actually be an even more unpopular opinion than that. The dislike button was removed while I was making this video, it's possible that they did that just for me. I sort of assume that people enjoy Spell of the Unknown because it's only the third movie, but I've actually spoken to people who love Jirachi Wishmaker. Let's just run through the story quickly. Ash, Brock, May, and Max head for the Millennium Festival where the Millennium Comet will be seen for the first time in a thousand years, as the name suggests. The comet is only visible in the sky for seven days. The only thing worth noting about the festival is the Furret Coaster. Oh my god. God, the Furret Coaster is incredible. I love it. The four leads go to see the great butler perform, and Max hears voices coming from a rock that's part of his act. Butler tells Max that he heard Jirachi's voice, and that the Pokemon can only come out when the Millennium Comet is in the sky. The comet appears above, the rock transforms into Jirachi, and then we get lots of Max, which is really unfortunate. It transpires that Butler is evil, and as an ex-team magma scientist wants to use Jirachi to summon Groudon or something, my notes are kind of all over the place. I've written here, Jirachi Wishmaker was the main inspiration for James Cameron's avatar, question mark. Butler eventually uses Jirachi to create some sort of tentacle monster Groudon, and then when it starts destroying the entire world, he has a change of heart. Ash, Jirachi, and Butler work together to get rid of Groudon, and everything is fine again. Max and Jirachi celebrate, and then with the comet gone, Jirachi turns back into a rock. I think the biggest flaw with this movie was making Max the character that Jirachi bonded with, because he's on screen a lot. There's a movie later on in this list that does a really similar thing to Wishmaker, but just executes it far, far better. We'll get back to that later though. Ultimately, by only briefly featuring the Furret Coaster, Jirachi Wishmaker was asking for a low ranking here. If the plot centered around Max wishing to be taller so he could ride the Furret Coaster, this could have easily been top 5. As it stands though, it's too short to ride. Number 21, Pokemon the Movie White, Victini and Zekrom, and Pokemon the Movie Black, Victini and Reshiram. Okay, let me just say up front, my biggest grievance here was that I watched these back to back and it's the exact same movie twice. You could blame me for that, and probably should, I definitely didn't need to watch both. I've got 3A4 pages worth of notes on these two, and at one point it just says, in all caps, why am I still taking notes on this? That was during the second movie, which for me was Black, Victini and Reshiram. The biggest thing these movies have going for them was Victini's adorability? Is that a word? Even then though, it's far from the most adorable Pokemon we'll meet on this list. Also, no Furret Coaster. 0 out of 10. Number 20, Pokemon the Movie 2000, The Power of One. I am just roasting the original trilogy here. This might be the most unpopular placement so far. I had really fond memories of this movie, but it did not live up to them. Even as I'm saying this, I can't believe that this ranked so low, but that's where I've put it. This ranking is incredibly arbitrary, I wouldn't take it personally. The plot of Pokemon the Movie 2000 revolves around a collector attempting to capture the three legendary birds Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres. Really, I just need to read you a little bit of the Shimuti prophecy that pretty much tells the whole story. Disturb not the harmony of fire, ice, or lightning, lest these titans wreak destruction upon the world in which they clash. Though the water's great guardian shall arise to quell the fighting, alone its song will fail, thus the earth shall turn to ash. We ultimately realize that instead of referring to the destruction of the earth, the prophecy is suggesting that Ash Ketchum will be required to help Lugia stop the legendary birds. Thus the earth shall turn to ash. 
This leads to a contender for the all-time greatest movie line. Well, right now I wish my mom had named me Bob instead of Ash. This movie really does have some incredibly quotable lines, but yeah, Ash saves the world with the help of Team Rocket and all is good. I should say this movie deserves some credit for actually giving Team Rocket something to do because most other entries on this list fail in that regard. Other than that, there's not a lot to say about this one. Like its immediate sequel, it's just kind of dull. Before moving on though, we should go out on a high with another one of those amazing lines. I could use pants. Number 19, Pokemon, Giratina, and the Sky Warrior. So, this serves as a direct sequel to a movie that we haven't covered yet in The Rise of Darkrai. All you really need to know about that one though is that Dialga and Palkia battle. As we learn in Giratina and the Sky Warrior, this has clearly rubbed Giratina the wrong way. The movie sees Ash, Brock, and Dawn trying to reunite a lost shaman with others of its kind while a generic villain named Zero tries to take over the world. It's all just sort of fine. The reverse world is an interesting setting, but beyond that, there isn't much worth writing home about. Shaman walks the line between adorable and annoying, which hurts the movie quite a bit. I really don't have a lot to say about this one. Let's move on. Number 18, Pokemon the movie, Kyurem vs. the Sword of Justice. I'm not sure whether this is a good or a bad thing, but this hardly feels like a movie at all. It's so short that it never really drags, but in that sense, it also just seems like a long episode. Of all the animated movies, it's probably the one where Ash and his traveling companions have the least to do. This movie gives exactly what the title promises. It's essentially just a slightly broken up battle between Kyurem and the trainee sword of justice, Keldeo. That's kind of why I like it. Kyurem is much more captivating than most of the human villains that the Pokemon movies have used, and Keldeo crams a fair bit of growth into the short runtime. If you've got a protagonist worth rooting for going up against a seemingly indomitable antagonist, you are set for a good time. That's exactly what Kyurem vs. the Sword of Justice provides. Number 17, Pokemon the Movie, Diancy and the Cocoon of Destruction. The first and narrowly worst of the XY generation, Diancy and the Cocoon of Destruction is an unremarkable but fun entry in the series. Clearly the writer, Hideki Sonoda, is a man who watches Spider-Man 3 and thinks it could do with a few more villains because about half the characters in this movie are antagonists. They're all keen to get their hands on Diancy, who has the rather unique ability to create diamonds from thin air. Well, she's supposed to be able to at least. At the beginning of the film, while Diancy can create diamonds, they disappear after a short period of time. That's less than ideal as she needs to make a new heart diamond for the diamond domain or it will crumble. All hope is not lost yet though. One of the many carbink from the diamond domain tells her to go and find Xerneas in the All Earth Forest and that its fairy aura will grant her the ability she requires. So Diancy sets off, but she is quickly cornered by Marilyn and Riot, two of our many, many villains. Ash and friends save her while the two bicker and after hearing Diancy's story agree to accompany her. Before they can get anywhere on their journey though, Diancy is kidnapped by Team Rocket. Welcome to the School of Hard Knocks. I certainly do appreciate your kind educational offer, but I must be going. Diancy is rescued by Millis Steel and makes it back to Ash and Co. You might be imagining that we've just added a new hero to offset the many villains, but don't worry, Millis and her father are bad guys too. Anyway, the group all travel to the Old Earth Forest where Diancy does meet Xerneas and experiences its fairy aura. There's no time to see if Diancy can now create permanent diamonds though as all of the bad guys show up on cue. In all the chaos as the various villains attempt to capture Diancy, they accidentally disturb Yveltal who emerges from its cocoon of destruction. Rather relatably, Yveltal is less than pleased about being woken up early. Less relatively, it settles on destroying the entire forest. Along the way, several people and Pokemon are turned to stone before Diancy mega evolves and creates a real heart diamond. That only briefly stops Yveltal though. In the end, Xerneas steps in and manages to calm Yveltal who promptly leaves. It's only then that we're shown that Pikachu is clipped by Oblivion Wing, so he turns to stone too. We get a nice role reversal callback to Pokemon the first movie before Xerneas restores Pikachu, meaning we get an adorable reunion scene. <laughs> All those who return to stone are revived by Xerneas, who then turns into a tree to protect the balance of nature. That's basically it. Diancy returns to the Diamond Domain and creates a brand new heart diamond, and they all lived happily ever after. I really think that Ash and Pikachu moment moved this several places up the list because I found it so adorable. In fairness, Diancy is a fun character, and other than the overabundance of villains, I really had no complaints about this one. Number 16, Pokemon the movie, Volcanion, and the Mechanical Mar- No, uh, let's try that again. Number 16, Pokemon the Movie, Volcanion, and the Mechanical Marvel. 
So we move straight from the first XY movie to the last, and there really isn't much to separate the two. Lots of my notes on this one center around how adorable Helioptile is, despite it only featuring in a few scenes. I will say Magirna, the so-called mechanical marvel, never quite captured my interest, but I did really enjoy Volcanion as a character. Hey, electric nuisance. Volcanion is mistrustful of humans at first, which makes the electromagnetic link between him and Ash somewhat problematic. As the movie goes on though, we learn that Volcanion acts as a protector to the Pokemon of the Plateau. They are all Pokemon who were mistreated by humans, leaving them fearful when Ash, Serena, Clement, and Bonnie arrive. In the end, Volcanion comes to trust Ash after everything they go through together. There's really not too much to say about this one. It's another solid entry, greatly helped by the presence of Helioptile. Oh, and Amora. Number 15, Pokemon the Movie, Genesect and the Legend Awakened. Let me start by telling you, this movie is set in New Torque City. I'm just gonna give you all a second to digest that, just like these New Torkers digest sandwiches. As soon as we're done, I could go for some sandwiches myself. Okay, no, we can't just talk about the New Torque tankies and sandwiches, we've got to actually discuss the movie, briefly. It centers around Ash, Iris, and Silence trip to Pokemon Hills, a nature reserve in the middle of what I can only assume is Central Pork. Pokemon Hills has a multitude of different environments, with plants taken from all over the world to help the various Pokemon get acclimated. While visiting the Pokemon Sanctuary, Ash encounters a lost Genesect who seems desperate to find its home. Naturally, Ash is a massive help. Mommy, mommy, where are you? Ah! Although that Genesect takes a liking to Ash, for some reason, the rest of its group aren't so warm. They eventually take over the reserve, attacking any person or Pokemon who stands in their way, building a gigantic nest right at its center. We come to realize that the Genesect are only at Pokemon Hills because the Panelosis transplanted there are the only thing that they remember from the Earth they once inhabited 300 million years ago. The movie ends with Ash and friends bringing the Genesect to the last place where Panelotuses still grow naturally, and they make their new home there. Lovely. So, after finishing this movie, I was pretty satisfied. I'd enjoyed it, but I wanted to mark how long it was for my notes because it felt pretty short. I already had a Wikipedia tab open, so I just went there and searched the movie quickly. When I scrolled down to check the runtime, I caught the last line of the movie's plot out of the corner of my eye. Ash, Iris, Silent, Eric, and Squidly Diddly take the Genesect there where they start building another nest. I was fairly sure one of these characters didn't exist in the movie, so I scrolled down further to the character section where I found Squidly Diddly, a music-loving anthropomorphic octopus who works at Pokemon Hills in New Torque City, originally from the Secret Squirrel show. Unlike his original counterpart, Squidly now speaks in a Scottish accent. Squidly's voice in the original Japanese release is provided by Takashi Yoshimura. In the English dub, Squidly is voiced by David Tennant. I only bring this up because I genuinely believe I happened across one of the most bizarre vandalizations of a Wikipedia page ever. Why did Genesect 13 make those edits? We may never know. But yeah, the movie was pretty good. Number 14, Pokemon The Rise of Darkrai. I suspect this will be the most unpopular placement on this list. I know that a lot of people really love The Rise of Darkrai, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I was expecting. The movie takes place in Alamos Town, home to the space-time towers. When Dialga and Palkia clash between dimensions, strange things start happening around Alamos Town, with Darkrai being blamed by Baron Alberto. The only thing I really have to say about him is that he's the worst. Why don't you come over to my place for a little dinner? Cool! Uh, huh? Alice is so not interested! <laughs> After his overt harassment is quelled by Dawn, Alberto takes out his anger on Darkrai, but while battling it with Licky Licky, the mythical Pokemon sends Ash to the Shadow Realm. When he wakes up in the Pokemon Center, we get yet another adorable Ash and Pikachu moment. Palkia shows up in Alamos the next day and transports the entire town to a different dimension. Darkrai reappears, and although this isn't strictly relevant to the plot, I feel like it's my duty to bring attention to the fact that it has legs. I feel like I'm not supposed to be seeing those. It's like seeing an owl's legs, it just feels wrong. Anyway, Dialga shows up as well and we get round 2, with Darkrai attempting to stop both the space and time Pokemon. Alamos Town begins crumbling and the only way to stop it is by calming the legendary Pokemon. The only way to do that is to play a certain song from the space-time towers which are essentially one big musical instrument. The architect, Godi, yes really, foresaw the clash between Dialga and Palkia so designed the towers for this exact moment. Ash and Dawn ascend the tower to play the song as Darkrai continues trying to stop the fight. It eventually pulls an Ash Ketchum and gets between the two attacking Pokemon to save everyone else. 
By sacrificing itself, Darkrai gives Ash and Dawn just enough time to play the song and calm the elegant Palkia before Alamo's town and its entire population was completely wiped out. Palkia restores the town and returns it to its rightful dimension before leaving without a word of apology. As everyone mourns the loss of Darkrai, its shadow appears on a nearby cliff face and we see that it's still alive. Presumably that has something to do with Dialga controlling time, it's never really explained. That mysterious return from the dead at least makes more sense than Professor Hale's wife in Spell of the Unknown, but I still think it detracts a bit from the ending. The Pokemon films are a big fan of that move. The emotional impact of a death followed up by a miraculous revival. In fact, almost every movie on this list so far has done it. It just all feels like having your cake and eating it too. This makes it sound like I want more dead Pokemon, which I don't. I just feel like because they go to that well so often, it really lessens the weight of all of those scenes. Other than that, I thought The Rise of Darkrai was good, just not quite as good as the rest. Number 13, Pokemon the Movie, Hoopa and the Clash of Ages. This is the only one of the 6th gen movies that really stood out to me. It's just total chaos and I sort of love it. Let's just quickly go over the plot. In the past, Hoopa had to be confined after it started summoning legendary Pokemon and destroying them for a laugh. In its new form, Hoopa can't travel through its own rings and won't be able to until it truly understands why it was confined. In the present day, Ash and Pikachu are pulled through a ring portal by Hoopa, who then summons lots of Pikachu because Ash likes them. There's a possessed object that causes a shadow of Hoopa to manifest itself as Hoopa's unbound form. That's not great. The group splits into two with Clement, Bonnie, Serena and Hoopa's current keepers needing to create a new object to trap the shadow while Ash, Pikachu and Hoopa stay to battle it. This is where the real chaos begins. Hoopa summons Latias, Latios and a shiny Rayquaza, all of whom end up Mega Evolve while the shadow brings forth Primal Kyogre and Groudon, Kyurem, Dialga, Palkia and Giratina. Then they all just battle. Just in time the big group return to seal the shadow back inside the bottle before Ash ends up possessed. Hoopa is able to calm the evil spirit with happy memories of its time in its confined form though, and all is good with the world once more. Except for the fact that the space and time are collapsing around us. Apparently it's against the space-time laws to have that many legendary Pokemon in the same place at the same time. There's no need to worry though, Ash Ketchum is on hand and he's sure to save the day. Pikachu, Thunderbolt, let's go! Um, look... <laughs> I know Thunderbolt has got Ash out of a lot of tricky situations in the past, but did he really just try to use it to stop space and time from collapsing? Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. In the end, Hoopa helps everyone escape from the dangerous void using its rings and finally understands its confinement, allowing it to escape too. Other than the total carnage, it's a happy ending to a movie built on chaos. I don't know why I like this one so much. Look, was Hoopa a good character? Yeah. Was the Clash of Ages exciting? Absolutely. Did this mostly rank high because Ash tried to stop space and time from crumbling with a thunderbolt? I'm not going to lie to you, it's very possible. Moving on. Number 12, Pokemon Zoroark Master of Illusions. The first film to crack the top half is the only standalone 4th gen film. There's a lot to like about Master of Illusions, from one of the best Pokemon movie villains to an interesting title Pokemon to the well-paced solid plot. Focusing on that first point though, Kodai might be my favourite Pokemon antagonist across all the movies. It's not a category teeming with great options, but Kodai really stands out. Unlike a lot of the half-hearted villains whose actions are ultimately redeemed after some dumb and selfish actions, Kodai is just pure evil. Honestly, as I'm saying this, I feel like this movie should rank higher on the list, but this is where it's staying. Zoro and Zoroark are both solid characters to build around, but this is really Kodai's movie. I feel like everyone should go and see this one for themselves. Still, I've put it at number 12. Even I'm starting to question my judgement now. Number 11, Pokemon Secrets of the Jungle. The most recent entry in the PCU only narrowly misses out on a top 10 spot. We're firmly into territory of movies I thoroughly enjoyed at this point though. Secrets of the Jungle begins with Zarude forced to leave his tribe to raise a human child he finds abandoned in the forest of Akoya. The mythical Pokemon is given no choice and leaves the heart tree where the rest of the Zarude live. We then jump 10 years into the future where the boy, Coco, is now traversing the forest with ease. The Pokemon who Coco now calls Dada has raised him to believe that he's also a Zarude. When we join them, it's just reaching the point where Coco is starting to question whether or not that's really the truth. After an argument, Coco runs away and goes full Green Goblin, forcing Ash Ketchum to rescue him. 
Yes, unsurprisingly, Ash happens to be in the forest of Okoya at the time and transports the unconscious boy back to nearby Milifa Town. When Coco awakes, it's in a state of pure shock. For the first time, we realize that Coco only speaks the language of the Zarud, it's just been helpfully translated for us during his scenes. As Coco attempts to escape the town, he begins to notice similarities between himself and Ash. When he ultimately makes it back to Dada, the Zarud admits the truth, handing over a photo of Coco's parents that he found at the beginning. We then get an incredibly rare mention of Ash's father, which really caught me off guard before some clues lead Ash and Coco to the nearby Biotope Company lab. Upon seeing the photo, the man in charge, Dr. Zed, reveals that Coco's parents were unfortunately dead. On top of that, he tells us that Coco's real name is Al Molybdenum. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably stick with Coco. After Dr. Zed starts asking questions about the healing spring and the heart tree, Coco gets suspicious and rushes off. As he heads straight for the home of the Zarud, it's revealed that Coco's had a tracker placed on him by Dr. Zed, who is, to the surprise of nobody, completely evil. The Zarud, who've hoarded all of the food in the jungle, have never been on great terms with the other Pokemon there. It's only when Zed begins tearing the forest apart that they all come together to protect one another in their home. During the battle, Dada is killed by Zed, but it's pretty brief as Coco revives him using jungle healing, so he's actually become part Zarud? Anyway, Zed is defeated and arrested, and everyone works together to heal the forest of Akoya. Coco decides to go off on a journey of his own at the end, and everyone lives happily ever after. I don't know how much it came across, but this is very much the Jungle Book meets Tarzan meets Avatar meets Drive Angry. Now, I've never actually seen Drive Angry, but I assume it's about driving angrily, and there's a recurring road rage theme in this movie. Over the opening credits, a car speeds up attempting to run over Coco as a baby. Then, when he's brought to Malifa Town, another vehicle attempts to run him down. Finally, it's revealed that Dr. Zed killed Mr. and Mrs. Malifdenum by running them off the road. So yeah, that family just seems to have some sort of genetic predisposition for getting in car accidents. Secrets of the Jungle may feel very familiar, but it does its job well. Coco's relationships with Dada and Ash are both great, and the setting is one of the best we've seen in a Pokemon movie. Dr. Zed is another lackluster villain, but beyond that, I really enjoyed Secrets of the Jungle. Number 10, Pokemon Destiny Deoxys. Who thought this would crack the top 10? Certainly not me. When I looked through the movies before starting my marathon, this one jumped out at me as a movie that I expected to rank low. I think that's mostly because I've never really cared for Deoxys, and honestly, I still don't. Destiny Deoxys has a great setting, some good characters, and two of the most adorable Pokemon in existence though, so you don't even need to care about the titular character. The story begins in the middle of an arctic expedition where Professor Lund's young son Tori is left traumatized after a meteorite causes a Pokemon stampede. There's a big battle with Deoxys and Rayquaza here too, but I'm focusing on the B-plot. Years later, Ash and friends arrive in LaRue City, an uber-modern tech-heavy utopia that happens to be the home of Tori and his father. We get some brief interactions between Ash and Tori where we learn that the boy who once adored Pokemon now finds them petrifying. Completely by accident, Tori ends up competing alongside Ash in a double battle, but is unable to do anything, frozen in fear by the Pokemon around him. As Tori tries to run from Ash to avoid a tough conversation, he's approached by a Plusle looking for assistance to help out its friend Minan, who's stuck in one of those weird tech bins. After helping Minan out, Tori flees once more. Okay, just quickly, Deoxys shows up in Luru City at this point and creates an aurora in the sky. Now, I know what you're thinking. An aurora. At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, localized entirely within that district. But yeah, that's what happens. As Ash, Brock, May, and Max get to know Tori a bit, they ease him into the world of Pokemon. Once he's bonded with the others, he brings them to meet his best friend, um, this thing. Then Rayquaza shows up because Deoxys is there and Professor Lund calls for the city to be evacuated. All of the main characters end up trapped in the city though, with a force field going up around it. They're eventually forced to go out into the city in search of food, and Minan gets captured by the Deoxys. I've skipped large chunks of the main story, but that meteorite from the beginning contained Deoxys, which is now that thing that Tori calls his friend. The other Deoxys is only in Luru City to rescue said friend. It keeps carrying away people and Pokemon because they create waves that are blocking Deoxys from finding its companion. Everyone works together to get the meteorite Deoxys back into its body, and they're reunited. In the end, they actually save Rayquaza, who finally understands them and leaves. There's one final climactic moment where Tori has to dive to save Plusilaminen before he himself is saved by Deoxys. It's implied that Plusilaminen stay with Tori at the end, and that's literally all that matters. I've mostly just gone through the stuff with Tori Plusilaminen there, because that's the part of the movie that kept me invested. 
Tori has a fairly simple character, but his story arc really worked for me. Along with a unique setting, that just made for a really fun movie to watch. Plus, Laminen are so, so good. Okay, number nine, Pokemon Arceus and the Jewel of Life. Another movie that I'm surprised made it this high on the list, Arceus and the Jewel of Life is the final film in the original Gen 4 trilogy. It continues on from the rise of Darkrai and Giratina and the Sky Warrior, finally bringing Arceus into play. The original one is such an obvious Pokemon to make a movie about with such an interesting origin and I thought Jewel of Life did a good job with it. A long time ago, Arceus was forced to protect the world from a series of meteorites losing its 16 life plates in the process. Seemingly destined to die, Arceus was rescued by a man named Damos, who's obviously voiced by Dan Green. Damos retrieves the life plates for Arceus, saving its life, and as thanks, it uses five of those plates to create the Jewel of Life. Arceus told Damos it would turn Machina Town, where he lived, from desolate wasteland to fertile paradise, and it did. Sadly, when Arceus returned for the Jewel, Damos refused, attacking his former friend, believing that without the Jewel, Machina Town would revert to a wasteland. As it was still missing five of its life plates, Arceus was forced to retreat but vowed to return and unleash its fury upon the planet. We learn all of this from Sheena, one of Damos' distant relatives who reveals that she now possesses the Jewel of Life. We also learn that Arceus Awakening is what sent Dialga and Palkia on a collision course with one another and thus led to the events of the last two movies. When Sheena attempts to return the Jewel though, it's revealed to be a fake and that makes Arceus a little bit angry. Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina work to stop Arceus' destruction, with Dialga sending Ash, Brock, Dawn, and Sheena back in time to fix things. There's also Kevin, but guys named Kevin don't get sent back in time. The four are originally sent back far enough to witness the betrayal, but that's not enough, so Dialga sends them back further to the beginning of that day. When they arrive, Sheena accompanies Marcus, Damos' assistant, while the other three are sent to jail until their story is straightened out. It's there that they meet Damos, who tells a completely different story to what we've heard from Sheena. Damos says that he wants to return the jewel, but Marcus rose up against him intent on keeping it. That's not the best news, as Sheena's currently telling him exactly what'll happen and how to avoid it. While all of that's going down, we get lots of adorable cameos from Pokemon being sadly overworked, like Cyndaquil and Chikorita. Marcus convinces Sheena that she should be the one to return the jewel to Arceus, not letting her in on the fact that he's taken it from the scepter where it's usually housed. So when Arceus returns once more, well, for the first time, technically, I guess, Sheena fails to give back the jewel. Marcus attacks while Arceus is unprepared, using the knowledge of what happened the first time. Marcus plans to kill Arceus by burying it in molten silver, which as far as villainous plans go, is pretty evil. In his mind, if Arceus dies there, it won't be a problem in the future and Sheena and the others will have no reason to come back. Elsewhere, Ash, Brock, and Dawn have escaped prison with Damos' help, and they're fighting to wrestle the jewel from Marcus. Ash ends up with it, and thanks to some more help from Damos, an almost dead Arceus reabsorbs the jewel and rescues everyone from the now collapsing temple. Ash, Brock, Dawn, and Sheena say their goodbyes to Damos, who thanks them before their return to the present. Although Arceus is still furious when they arrive, it calms upon seeing Ash, the altered version of history now present in its memory. Thanks to the hard work of the people, Machina Town has stayed lush and fertile despite the absence of the Jewel of Life. There's also a mural celebrating Ash, Brock, Dawn, and Sheena. But not Kevin. Because he was left home alone. Number 8. Pokemon Detective Pikachu Okay, I don't think I really need to spend too much time on this one, as I'm guessing most of you have seen it. What I will say is that I massively preferred this one on a rewatch. I wasn't too impressed on my first viewing, but that's probably because I was getting too bogged down in the fairly unimpressive plot. Once you ignore all of that and absorb yourself in the world, it becomes much more enjoyable. Look, I obviously wish that Detective Pikachu was voiced by Danny DeVito, I mean I'm not a crazy person, but Ryan Reynolds does a really good job here. Part of what made me appreciate it so much this time around was realising that if this was being made today, you know that would have been Chris Pratt. So let's just all be thankful that this one's already out. More on the look of the movie, it really is a bit of a roller coaster. Some Pokemon look fantastic, and others are kind of horrifying. I think some of the best shots in this movie are just establishing shots where you aren't really getting close up on the Pokemon and you can just appreciate the little details. Justice Smith and Catherine Newton have a lot of cheesy dialogue to read through, but I think they both do pretty well with it, especially the latter. Bill Nye is obviously never going to disappoint, but doesn't really get much to do unfortunately. So yeah, a fun setting, some great set pieces, plenty of funny lines, and a solid cast. Aside from a few iffy designs, the basic plot, and the lack of Danny DeVito, this one's really good and well-deserving of a spot in the top 10. 
Number seven, Pokemon the movie, I choose you. Okay, as someone who's produced hours of content pondering the question, what if Ash woke up on time, I feel like it might have been obvious that I'd like this one. Instead of asking that question, this movie is set in a universe where Ash receives the Rainbow Wing when he first sees Ho-Oh. In that sense, it isn't exactly alike, but it is just a reimagining of the original series. Instead of travelling with Misty and Brock, it's Verity and Sorrel that accompany Ash this time around. Rather than rescuing Charmander from Damien, it's a trainer named Cross that abandons it. Unlike Damien, Cross is a recurring character in Ash's journey, popping up to battle him from time to time. Cross's aggressive win-at-all-cost mentality does lead the inexperienced Ash down some darker paths. If only my first Pokemon had been a Squirtle or a Bulbasaur. Be Pega? After falling out with Verity, Sorrel, and most importantly Pikachu, Ash has a nightmare of a world without Pokemon. Basically, he dreams about the real world and realizes <laughs> how awful it must be, which is sort of a burn on all of us. It does make Ash realize how much Pikachu means to him though before we're let down another dark path. Sorrel tells the story of how his family's Luxray was forced to rescue him after he got lost in the snow and... it died. Yep, Sorrel was solely responsible for the death of his family's Luxray. I know you're thinking that later on I'm going to reveal that it shows up at the end and everything's okay. Nope, Luxray is dead. That good mood just keeps on rolling into the next sequence where we have to relive the whole Bye Bye Butterfree storyline. Let's just skip to the end. Ash makes it to the summit of Mount Tensai where the Rainbow Wing has been leading him this whole time but Cross is there waiting for him. They battle and Ash wins but Cross steals the Rainbow Wing anyway. As Cross is evil, this doesn't lead to Ho-Oh being summoned but Marshadow shows up instead and has the wild Pokemon attack everyone. We're eventually taken back to the beginning of the movie and the original series. That moment where the only thing Ash can think about is protecting Pikachu, so asks him to get inside his Pokeball, and then this happens. Can I offer you a nice egg in this trying time? Yeah. Seriously, how good would Danny DeViso have been in Detective Pikachu? Such a missed opportunity. Anyway, Pikachu gets back into his ball just in time as Ash is hit by all of the attacks, but this time around it's his determination to be with Pikachu that brings him back from the dead. I guess Luxray just didn't love Sorrel enough, which actually makes sense given how everything went down. Ash uses a new Rainbow Wing to summon Ho-Oh and they battle before we get to see the meme that ends the movie. I think the Pokemon movies were getting a bit stale by the time I Choose You rolled around and it was a much needed shot in the arm for the series. I love that they just chose a bit of a random concept and ran with it. I've said it a few times in this video, Ash and Pikachu are the heart of almost every movie here and this is a great movie to introduce you to their story. Good stuff. Number six, Pokemon Forever, Celebi, the voice of the forest. I'm fairly certain that nobody is going to agree with me on this one, but my nostalgia for voice of the forest means it's going to rank just outside the top five. This was the last Pokemon movie I watched within, say, a year of its release until I got back into the franchise. I remember loving this movie as a kid, and it didn't disappoint on a rewatch. The movie begins with a young boy named Sam being warned to be careful as he enters a forest with his sketchbook. It's the voice of the forest that he's told to listen out for, as it's said that if you aren't perfectly still when you hear the voice, it'll transport you through time. When Sam makes it inside the forest, he finds a Celebi being chased by a Pokemon hunter and rescues it. Badly injured and worried about what could come though, Celebi, the voice of the forest, travels forward in time taking a sketchbookless Sam with it. Years on in the future, Ash, Misty and Brock enter the same forest where they come across the newly arrived Sam. They take him back to a nearby village where the woman who warned him all those years ago recognizes him and returns his sketchbook. Sam comes to terms with the fact that he's traveled through time and then convinces everyone that they need to go and find Celebi who brought him here. Once they find the injured Celebi, who is very adorable by the way, it takes some time to convince it that they're there to help but it eventually accepts. They're led to the Lake of Life by the wild Pokemon where Sam lowers Celebi into the waters, healing it almost instantly. Suddenly, full of energy, Celebi takes Ash and Sam flying and then picks berries for everyone, and seriously, it's all so adorable. In case you're wondering, the word adorable comes up in my notes for this movie about 15 times. That night, Ash and Sam bond over their love of Pokemon as Sam draws what I've called an adorable picture of Celebi and Pikachu. This whole time, the Iron Masked Marauder, an apparent Team Rocket member, has been hunting down Celebi. Unsurprisingly, he's voiced by Dan Green, and his plan is to capture Celebi in one of his Dark Balls which makes any Pokemon evil and maxes out its power. Once Yugi succeeds in catching Celebi, he just instructs it to start destroying the whole forest. I think the Iron Mask Marauder wanted to use the evil Celebi to wrest power from Giovanni and take over Team Rocket, so I'm not exactly sure where the forest destruction comes into it. 
Ash and Sam make their way to Evil Salaby and manage to snap it back to reality, breaking the power of the Dark Ball, but the titular Pokemon is grievously injured. I mean, it looks like a wilted leak, and that can't be a good thing. Even the waters of the Lake of Life can't heal Celebi this time though. So a bunch of other Celebi show up, heal the wilted leak, and all is good again. Celebi and Sam say their goodbyes, and then the voice of the forest returns the young boy to his time. Ash struggles with this, having found a true friend in Sam. Later on, he's comforted by Professor Oak, who he, Misty, and Brock have called to tell all about their adventure. Oak tells him that his friendship with Sam will stand the test of time, which really cheers him up. As the call ends and our trio walk away, Misty wonders how Professor Oak knew the boy's name. Smash cut. No, there's no smash cut. Just cut to Professor Oak looking over the sketch of Celebi and Pikachu that he did all those years ago. Oh my god. That's why this movie's at number six. Look, the year is 2001. M. Night is arguably already past his best, but Pokemon Forever is carrying on the beautiful tradition of wholly unnecessary twists that you'll still be thinking about 20 years later. Honestly, if there's one person who didn't know what the twist in this movie was and I was able to give them that moment of excitement, it was worth going through the whole plot. What a film. Okay. Number five, Pokemon Ranger and the Temple of the Sea. Do you remember like 40 minutes ago when I told you that there was a movie that did a lot of the same things as Jirachi Wishmaker but just executed them much better? No? Me neither. Anyway, this is that film. The bond between Mei and Manaphy is so wonderful and it just blows everything Wishmaker does out of the water. Or into the water, in this case. I don't really care about the Pokemon Rangers who make up half of the title, but when Manaphy is being adorable in every other scene, I'm not sure that that matters. We've also got a villain who's hilariously over the top, but I think that's a massive improvement on Forgettable. There's some scenes of Ash being obscenely heroic, which are always fun, but for the most part, yeah, this is all about May and Manaphy. You make me so happy. Happy, happy! <gasps> Number four, Pokemon the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back. Okay, we've made it full circle, all the way back to the first movie. Going into this, I figured it might rank fairly low. Maybe it's the nostalgia talking again, but this deserves a top 5 spot. Yes, there's a lot of really weird mistakes, but a lot of them I just find kind of funny. I went over the basic plot of this movie when covering the CGI remake, but there is a little bit to add here. The version I'm covering, which I consider to be the complete film, adds a lot of backstory to explain the movie's origins. Essentially, Giovanni is funding the scientists because he wants the most powerful Pokemon in existence, but Dr. Fuji's main motivation is to clone his deceased daughter. This obsession with bringing her back has driven him over the edge, causing his wife to leave him, and it's all pretty dark. Beyond that though, there's so much about this movie that I love. Like this missing poster for Nurse Joy. Wanted, a missing person. Also, the fact that Minnesota is officially canon in the world of Pokemon. I didn't know Vikings still existed. They mostly live in Minnesota. There's also this bit where all of the Pokemon are fighting with their clones, and Vaporeon is clearly just playing with its mirror image. 10 out of 10. Very adorable. You've also got this killer Meowth line that was weirdly cut from the remake. You're right, we do have a lot in common. Maybe if we started looking at what's the same instead of always looking at what's different, well, who knows? I'm not sure everyone will agree with this high placement, but there's so much to like here that I couldn't make a case for it being lower. Number three, Pokemon Heroes Latios and Latias. Very respectable podium finish for the final original series movie. As the title suggests, the movie tells the story of Latios and Latias, two legendary Pokemon who live secretly in the city of Altamar. Their father, or Latios, gave his life to protect the city once upon a time, leaving behind the soul dew which is said to contain, well, his soul. When Ash saves Latias, who's disguised as a human from two Team Rocket members intent on stealing the soul dew, she takes a liking to him. Although it takes Ash a while to figure out what's going on with the silent girl he saved, when he does, we get some great scenes with the two of them. Latios and Latias reside in a secret garden within Altamar, but Annie and Oakley, the aforementioned Rocket members, ultimately track them down. They steal the Soul Dew and capture Latios, who protects Latias and tells her to run. Annie and Oakley's plan is to activate the defense mechanism of Altamar, an ancient but dangerous machine built to protect the city. This doesn't quite work out for them as Ash and Latias save the day, but their evil deeds end up draining Altamar of water. That minor problem becomes major when all of the water begins crashing back towards the city in one giant wave. Latios and Latias fly out to meet it and manage to stop the tidal wave from causing any real damage. 
The effort of stopping it costs and already weakened Latios his life though. It's honestly heartbreaking as Latios' sacrifice leaves Altamar with another soul Jew and we realise Latias has now lost a father and brother because of human selfishness. For the first time, a Pokemon passes on in a Pokemon movie without miraculously returning. Like I mentioned earlier, this hits so much harder for that fact. After seeing numerous titular Pokemon sacrificing themselves and then resurrecting, the emotional impact of a permanent death is really amplified. Beyond the ending though, Pokemon Heroes Latios and Latias is just an all-around good Pokemon movie. Number 2. Pokemon the Movie The Power of Us when I talked about Secrets of the Jungle earlier, I mentioned the few movies from which it seemed to draw heavily. Well, The Power of Us really feels to me like it started based around the idea of one movie. It's The Breakfast Club. If you've seen the two films, then you're probably seriously doubting me, but listen. Other than Ash Ketchum, we've got five main characters to deal with in The Power of Us. There's Taran, a shy genius researcher, the brain. Risa, a star runner who was shaken by a past injury, the athlete. Margot, the mayor's daughter, the princess, Harriet, a reclusive old woman who hates Pokemon, the basket case, and Callahan, a compulsive liar who doesn't not look like Judd Nelson. Whether or not The Breakfast Club was the starting point, these characters work. Sometimes their stories are intertwined and sometimes they stand on their own or alongside Ash, but at no point does it stop working for me. The movie takes place during the annual Wind Festival in Fula City. Ash Ketchum is in attendance with his trusty partner Pikachu, but let's check in with the Breakfast Club first. Risa is in Fula City because her brother Rick, who's in the hospital, has asked her to catch him an Eevee. Risa isn't very knowledgeable about Pokemon, but Rick tells her she'll find one in Fula City, so she goes there for him. Callahan is at the Wind Festival with his sister and her daughter, his niece, Kelly. Although she's ill, she loves spending time with her uncle, believing every word he tells her about his fabricated adventures. Taran lives in Fula City, so he's nervously milling around, preparing for a research presentation while Harriet, another local, is just trying to avoid all of the Pokemon present at the festival. Finally, we've got Margot. She sees her father off, and then after crossing paths with Ash, seems to head into the forest on the mountain overlooking the city. That's where our journey begins. It's basically detention. Before the festival properly gets underway, Kelly bumps into Risa, who informs her that she's looking for an Eevee. Obviously, the young girl points her to her all-knowing uncle, who sends Risa off into the forest as a complete guess, his knowledge of Pokemon almost as limited as hers. Also, Harriet has to drop off some documents with Taran, but when he startles her, she spills something on herself. The festival then opens with a Pokemon catch race, which is exactly what it sounds like. Callahan's niece insists he enter, having heard all of his amazing stories and wanting to see him in action. Luckily for him, Taran saw him brashly telling a captivated crowd one of his fables earlier and agrees to help him on the condition that Callahan presents his research for him. So Callahan enters using Taran's Staryu, with Ash the only other entrant of note. Thanks to Taran's earpiece instructions, Callahan is able to take an early lead, saving a terrified Sudowoodo as he does. Ash spends the majority of his time in the catch race attempting to stop a rampaging Tyranitar, so Callahan manages to win. That night, Riza realises that she's been sent on a wild goose chase by Callahan, searching in an area that's totally off limits, while Harriet's troubled to find a number of wild Pokemon following her. So, the next day, Riza enlists Ash to help her find an Eevee, recognising him from his second place finish in the catch race. They locate an Eevee quickly enough, and Ash walks her through the process of catching a Pokemon, even lending her Pikachu for the task. Riza succeeds in catching the Eevee, and it's all very adorable. At the same time, Harriet is confronting Taran, who reveals that she spilled Essence of Sweet Scent on herself yesterday, and that's what's attracting the Pokemon. I haven't even mentioned Team Rocket yet. In fact, I've left Jesse, James, and Meowth out of most of my quick summaries, because usually they're irrelevant, but they actually play a big part here. Another tick for the power of us. They've been skulking around the research pavilion since the start, trying to get their hands on whatever Taran's working on, and they do. When Callahan arrives late to his presentation, Taran's forced to do it himself, which goes disastrously with him accidentally showing the footage of his catch race guidance. Before everyone, including Kelly, has time to digest that, Team Rocket are discovered trespassing and throw a smoke bomb to escape. In the chaos, Eevee is trampled by the crowd and its leg is broken. Thankfully, Taran's on hand with his chancy to provide some immediate medical care. Kelly's unnamed illness also flares up, possibly due to the smoke, or more likely because her lying uncle broke her heart. Callahan is told by his sister Mia that she's going to take Kelly home the next day to avoid any more complications. Callahan leaves angry with himself, but instead lashes out at the Sudowoodo who's been following him since the catch race. 
The next morning, the winds have died down and everyone learns that the Eternal Flame has been stolen. The Eternal Flame is what helps Lugia find Fula City and Lugia is the one who provides the city with wind. That's the whole reason for the Wind Festival. They need Lugia for wind, they need wind for electricity, and they need electricity for, well, everything. They manage to track down the thief in the forest and it turns out to be Margot. Yes, the mayor's daughter who I've barely mentioned so far. Her time has been spent in the forest feeding a heretofore unseen Pokemon that's now revealed to be Zaraora. Margot stole the Eternal Flame hoping to put an end to the Wind Festival so everyone would leave Fula City and Pokemon hunters would stop combing the woods looking for rare Pokemon. Margot reveals that Zaraora saved her life, injuring itself in the process and she's been taking care of it ever since. The mayor then confesses that he's been hiding something too. The city's government invented a story about the forest being cursed after humans caused a wildfire 50 years ago. Zaraora saved many of the wild Pokemon but became hostile towards humans so to protect it, the former mayor told the people of Fula that it had fled. Now, I never went into detail on what Team Rocket stole earlier, but it was a capsule of effect spore that Tarn was working on and it just exploded. Ash rallies the whole group and they each figure out what they can do to help. Tarn needs to retrieve his natural cure solution in the city and then join Callahan, who's now called Sudowoodo, and Harriet at the abandoned power plant that she designed as a young woman. They can disperse the solution from there. Riza needs to run the Eternal Flame back to its perch so Lugia will be able to find Fula City by morning and Ash and Margo will stay behind to help the sick and injured Pokemon, a problem slightly exacerbated by the forest fire that's now started. Even Team Rocket chip in to help, giving Tarn the lumberries they were attempting to sell to fix the problem that they created. The fire killed the power in town which prevented Tarn from making the natural cure solution so lumberries will have to work instead. On their way to the power plant, Harriet reveals to Callahan that her snubble perished in the first fire 50 years ago, which is why she distances herself from any and all Pokemon now. If she makes no more meaningful connections, she can't be hurt again. Maybe she's Judd Nelson. That would make Callahan Ali Sheedy? The group all work together and succeed in getting the Lumberry solution dispersed, preventing the effect spore from doing any damage. The fire is still spreading though, so the entire city has to band together to help out. Eventually, they're able to put out the fire after Zaraora learns to trust Ash, and Riza places the Eternal Flame just in time to summon Lugia. The Guardian of the Seas brings rain to put out the remaining embers present in the forest, and then brings the wind that gives the festival its name. On the one hand, I feel like I might have went into too much detail there, but on the other, I think everyone needs to know about the power of us. It's got, by far and away, the best cast of human characters we've seen in any Pokemon movie, and they all have really satisfying arcs and stories. It just gets the balance perfect for me. The quality of I Choose You, The Power of Us, and Secrets of the Jungle makes me really excited to see what's coming next. So, there's only one movie left now, and it just pipped The Power of Us to the post. Number 1. Pokemon, Lucario, and the Mystery of Mew I sort of credit this movie with getting me back into the franchise. It had probably been 5 or 6 years since I'd played a new Pokemon game or consumed any content beyond replaying Crystal for the millionth time. I was really sick and decided to search out a Pokemon movie. This was the first one I could find and after finishing it, I immediately wanted to go and play through the Gen 4 games that I'd never played before. If I'd happened upon Jirachi Wishmaker instead, maybe I wouldn't have gotten back into it at all. No, scrap that. Fart Coaster would have been enough to pull me back in. What I'm getting at is that I had really high expectations when coming back to Lucario and the Mystery of Mew and it lived up to them. In the distant past, we see Lucario using its aura powers to locate two armies about to go to war. At the nearby Cameron Palace, Queen Rin discusses the impending war with Sir Aaron, Lucario's master. Rin tells Aaron that as queen, she cannot leave her castle. If it's going to fall, she shall fall with it, so he hops on a Pidgeot and flies to Lucario. Sir Aaron tells him that he's abandoned the queen and castle and won't be returning. Before Lucario can reason with him, Sir Aaron throws his staff down, capturing the Pokemon inside like a Pokeball. As the armies clash, Queen Rin is given the staff by Pidgeot, who has returned to the castle alone. Then, the Tree of Beginnings starts to glow green in the distance, and the war is suddenly ended. It's said that the tree's power turned hatred to understanding, and that Sir Aaron was the hero who'd activated it. Centuries later, Ash, Brock, May, and Max arrive at Cameron Palace for their annual celebration of Sir Aaron, where they crown a new Guardian of the Aura with a battle tournament. Of course, Ash wins the whole thing, defeating Kid Summers in the final. During a banquet that night, Ash is forced to sit and watch while everyone enjoys themselves, serving his role as Guardian of the Aura with Sir Aaron's staff in hand. Throughout the opening sequence, we see plenty of Mew, who lives in the Tree of Beginning, transforming into different Pokémon. As an APOM, Mew leads all of the protagonist's Pokémon to a playroom upstairs. 
Kid has been sneaking around during the party and spots Mew from the roof of the castle, sending in two Weavile to place a tracker on the mythical Pokemon. There's a big scuffle and Mew ultimately transforms into a Pidgeot and flies away with Pikachu and Meowth, saving them from the attackers. Meanwhile, downstairs, Ash is told to copy the hero's pose from the painting of Sir Aaron. When he obeys, Lucario is released from the staff, instantly confronting Ash who he believes to be Sir Aaron. Once Lucario is able to open his eyes, he realises his mistake and flees. When they track down Lucario, Eileen, a descendant of Queen Rin, explains that everything he remembers happened long ago. Everyone explains their version of events to Lucario, who fills in the blanks, telling them Sir Aaron is no hero. Then Max bursts in to tell everyone that Mew was attacked and flew off with Pikachu and Meowth. Wait, I can't remember what Mew transformed into, though. Maybe Kid can help me out here? I was on the roof when I saw Mew change into a pigeon. Ah, a pigeon, of course. How could I forget? Kid also points them in the direction of the Tree of Beginning, which Eileen explains is actually an elaborate rock formation. Ash figures the only way to get Pikachu back is to head there himself, so that's what he does. Brock, May, and Max tag along, and Eileen asks Lucario to accompany them. Kid joins them too, apparently she's just an adventurer who was acting incredibly suspicious. Finally, Jesse and James hide out in back, keen to rescue Meowth themselves. While all of this is happening, Mew is just having a good time with its new friends. Mew is the OG adorable Pokemon in the movies, and it is still killing it in that regard. On the road to the Tree of Beginning, we learn about Time Flowers, which record events from when they were planted and can replay them when activated. It's a pretty major plot contrivance, but I'm willing to accept it. That night, Ash and Lucario have an argument about whether or not people and Pokemon can be friends, with both of them making some harsh accusations. Ash suggests Lucario is lying about Sir Aaron, while Lucario posits that Pikachu ran away to escape his weak trainer. They have a bit of a fight that could just never end well for Ash before going their separate ways for the night. The next morning, they reach the spot where Sir Aaron betrayed Lucario, and a time flower shows everyone else exactly what happened. Ash apologises for doubting Lucario, who accepts and tells him to never abandon Pikachu. They push on towards the Tree of Beginning, where it quickly becomes apparent that the Regis are its protectors. More than that, the tree seems to be actively fighting the humans inside it. While Ash and Pikachu fight to get to one another, Orange Goo starts swallowing up some of the humans. I've got in my notes here, Pikachu, Mew, and Meowth are Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. I assume the scene that spawned that note just played, if not, just know that I've watched a lot of Pokemon movies and I've slightly lost my mind. Ash and Pikachu eventually make their way back together, with lots of good Ash and Lucario bonding moments along the way. Thank you, Mew. Do you see what I'm saying about Mew being adorable? The tree is still fighting what it perceives to be parasites though and swallows Ash leaving no more humans inside. Mew sees how heartbroken Pikachu is by this loss and activates the tree of beginning just like it did centuries ago. The humans all reappear but the effort has greatly weakened Mew. The symbiotic relationship between Mew and the tree means it begins to break down and collapse around them. Mew leads Ash, Kid, and Lucario to the heart of the Tree of Beginning, where Lucario spots Sir Aaron's gloves. Then, a Time Flower reveals the truth. Sir Aaron locked up Lucario so it couldn't follow him and then used his aura to power the tree, giving his life in the process. Mew tells Lucario that they can repeat the feat to save the tree now, but he isn't strong enough to do it alone. Throughout the movie, we've been hearing that Ash has a similar aura to Sir Aaron, so he joins Lucario and together their aura combines to power Mew. And the last second though, Lucario shoves Ash out of the way so he won't be destroyed like Sir Aaron. The Tree of Beginning is saved and Mew is full of energy once more, but Lucario is not. As he collapses to the ground, he activates another Time Flower which shows us Sir Aaron's final message to Lucario. You are my closest friend. I feel the same. It's genuinely really quite touching. Lucario then fades away upon hearing his friend's last words. During the end credits, we see the painting of Sir Aaron in the palace has been altered, with Lucario now standing alongside him. I really love this movie. The time flowers are so overly convenient, but in a world where they exist, I don't think it's out of the realms of possibility that Sir Aaron would ask Mew to plant some, so Lucario could see why he did what he did, on the off chance Lucario was ever in the heart of the Tree of Beginning. Maybe. In a movie as good as Lucario and the Mystery of Mew, I don't really care about small details like that though. There's just so much to like here. And that's the list. I had a great time watching all of these movies, in case that wasn't clear, and a less great time writing this script. That's why we're so far removed from my last video. It's tough to turn the best part of half a notepad worth of notes into a video that isn't like eight hours long. What I've learned is that I can have fun with just about anything as long as there are Pokemon involved, but it's still very easy to separate the good from the bad. 
I'm really pleased to see the direction things are going, with the last few non-remake entries being some of the best I've seen. I'm sure with most lengthy franchises you start with the best and slowly drift further and further from that, with later entries being the worst of the lot. In I Choose You, The Power of Us and Secrets of the Jungle though, Pokemon seems to be somewhat revitalised of late. I hope to see more of that going forward. The films took a pretty noticeable dip in the 5th and 6th generations, with none of them even cracking the top half, but it's good to see we're getting back towards the best. As this has already been incredibly long, I don't want to overcomplicate the outro, so I'm just going to thank you so much for watching. If you stuck around this long, I really truly appreciate it. Hopefully it won't be quite as long until the next video, but yeah, I'll see you then.